Afghanistan dominates the agenda as leaders of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization gather in Tajikistan. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu and this is The Heat. The SCO is in its 20th year, and this time the major challenge is Afghanistan's future. With the Taliban back in power, how does it affect the region? CGTN's Alosha Milankovic reports from Dushanbe. The word dominated the SCO-related meetings here in Dushanbe is Afghanistan. The present and the future of that country topped the agenda of all official discussions on Thursday. Even the meeting between Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi and his Russian, Iranian and Pakistani counterparts opened with remarks on the future of Afghanistan. After 40 years of turmoil and instability in that country, its neighbors and the countries in Europe and Asia would like to see it attain stability and prosperity. SEO members think this is the only way to prevent the country from becoming a breeding ground for countless extremist groups that might export their ideology abroad. Before the main leaders' meeting scheduled on Friday, delegations from member countries hope to iron out a joint strategy to help Afghanistan stand on its own feet, something that everybody here thinks cannot be done without China's support. Alyosha Milenkovic, CGTN, Dushanbe. We have a lot to discuss. Let's bring in our panel. Joining us from London, Jadash Shams is the former deputy head of mission at the Embassy of Afghanistan in Islamabad, Pakistan. Here in Washington, D.C., Eugene Chasovsky is a geopolitical analyst and former senior Eurasia analyst at Stratfor. From Detroit, Michigan, we are joined by Saeed Khan. He is a lecturer of Near East and Asian Studies at Wayne State University. And from Beijing, Shindo Xu is the host of CGTN's Dialogue Weekend and a senior fellow with the Pangold Institution. Thank you, everyone, for being with us. Uh, let's start in Beijing with Shindo Xu. Shindo, this is the first major international meeting uh, taking place after the U.S. retreat from Afghanistan and the Taliban takeover. China, of course, has much at stake. What are expectations from this summit? Well, I think from the Chinese side, the, the expectation is like uh, SCU countries could work together on at least uh, several uh, issues. For example, uh, how to deal with the, the possible refugee situation from Afghanistan. Uh, if you look at uh, the countries, uh, you know, which are surrounding, who surround Afghanistan, they are all SCU members plus Iran observer stat, uh, status. And Iran is likely to officially join SCO this year on the summit meeting. Uh, so, yes, their involvement is the most important in order to deal with the issue. Similarly, you want to uh, issues of uh, the drug trafficking to be dealt with. And again, you need the cooperation of all those neighboring countries, including China, Pakistan, Iran, and uh, Central uh, Asian countries over there. Uh, of course, if you look at the future of Afghanistan, its peace and stability, and SCO countries are uh, most directly affected one way or the other. Uh, so they all have a stake in the future, uh, prosperity, stability, and peace in Afghanistan. There is uh, then they need to look at how we can help uh, the Taliban uh, and possibly an inclusive government, how to help them stabilize the situation. Uh, inside this country. I think these issues are the top concern from the Chinese point of view, likely, um, you know, also shared by the rest of SU countries. Uh, Zara Shams, uh, Afghanistan, of course, is not at this meeting, but as we just heard from Shindo Shu, all its neighbors are in Dushanbe for the summit. Um, what will the Taliban be expecting? What is the best case scenario for the Taliban from this summit, given that the United States and its allies are now turning the screws on Afghanistan. So what do they expect to come from this regional grouping? Uh, I believe uh, uh, Taliban uh, look forward for more positive uh, support and response from the region. Uh, if we see uh, to the Afghanistan situation and the regional uh, perspective, I believe that the uh, United States have thrown its, uh, its burden uh, on the region. 
uh, and it's now uh, uh, Afghanistan looks uh, like to be an issue, uh, frankly speaking, an issue issue uh, because the whole neighbors, China, Russia, uh, and the Central Asian states, uh, Iran, Pakistan, uh, they are now directly, uh, they will be affected uh, from uh, Afghanistan issue, any turmoil, any trouble, if it's refugees, if it's economy, if it's terrorism. Uh, so that, that's uh, now in uh, uh, all these member states' issues. Uh, and um, Afghanistan will also be looking forward and uh, Taliban uh, because uh, uh, they are now currently facing uh, huge economic issues. They're not able to pay even the salaries of the government staff. They are looking forward uh, that the government uh, should be uh, recognized uh, and they should have diplomatic relations with the, uh, particularly starting from the neighbors uh, and the influential neighbors, including Russia and uh, China. Uh, and uh, so uh, I believe that uh, Taliban are uh, somehow optimistic uh, looking forward uh, for the statements that came earlier from uh, China and Russia that was uh, more like uh, supportive. So they believe that the region will support them. Eugene Tchaikovsky, uh, great to have you with us on the show. Welcome. Um, the SCO has said that it wants to restore the legitimacy of state power in Afghanistan through what it calls inclusive, peaceful dialogue. How does that happen? How does the SCO figure out a mechanism to extend uh, recognition and legitimacy to the Taliban? Well, I think it's important, first of all, to mention that the SCO is more of a dialogue uh, mechanism for various countries. So not every country is going to have the same exact policy when it comes to you know, dialogue with, with Afghanistan. But for the most part, uh, you know, Russia, China, and most of the Central Asian countries have said they're basically having a pragmatic approach and you know it will depend on the extent to which Afghanistan under the Taliban is willing to cooperate especially when it comes to issues like militancy you know preventing the spillover of militant groups um, so that's what they're primarily interested in and that dialogue will succeed to the extent uh, that the Taliban are willing to follow through with that pledge so do you think at some stage the group or perhaps some countries in this group will open a dialogue with the Taliban in Afghanistan. Well, Russia and China, you know, have directly said that, you know, their recognition um, of the Taliban will depend on the actions that the group takes. So whether we're talking about from the security situation, you know, certainly China is interested in um, having an economic role there. Russia has already had an uh, existing relationship with, with the Taliban, albeit to an unofficial degree. So all of this is kind of in an early stage at this point, and at this point it will depend on the actions that the Taliban takes. Said Khan, Pakistan is seen as having the most influence with the Taliban in Afghanistan. Uh, what kind of outcome will Pakistan be looking for from this summit, given that Pakistan will also be there to act in its own interests as well? Well, I think ideally for uh, both Pakistan and for the Taliban, uh, they would seek the SCO to uh, confer a kind of a formal recognition uh, of the Taliban uh, as the legitimate government in, uh, in Kabul. That is, of course, unlikely to happen for several reasons. One is that, according to the SCO's own constitution, there needs to be a unanimous vote. And it seems unlikely at this time that uh, Tajikistan and even India would be willing to go ahead and confer uh, the Taliban with that kind of uh, appellation. The other issue is, of course, whether at this stage there are still some uncertainties regarding Taliban itself, uh, given uh, the uh, reportage of uh, the Taliban and the Haqqani network, this uh, power-sharing agreement in Kabul uh, being a, a little bit uh, tenuous at this point, uh, it seems like the SCO is going to uh, operate uh, with uh, a little bit of a cautious attitude. But getting back to Pakistan, I think that this idea that if the Taliban are already in power as they are, that is the presumption of the legitimate government in Afghanistan, and they uh, recognize in Islamabad that they're going to be able to wield a lot of leverage, and perhaps along with China's role, uh, as the uh, dominant force within the SCO, greater collaboration between Islamabad and Beijing. Of course, they already have uh, vested interests in uh, the security and the safety and stability of Afghanistan because of CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. So it'll be very interesting to see how far Pakistan is willing to push its agenda uh, in Dushanbe.
So what would Pakistan's main concerns be at the meeting? I mean, we heard from Shindo Shu earlier, and he was talking about this refugee crisis, which is getting bigger all the time. There is also uh, concerns over security in the region. Those are the two big issues for uh, for Pakistan. Uh, certainly, we have seen uh, over the last several decades the instability in Afghanistan spilling over into uh, Pakistan. Of course, the Taliban uh, uh, had their inception uh, within the refugee camps in Pakistan. But what does it mean to destabilization with the prospect of extremism operating within Pakistan? And at this stage in Pakistan's uh, efforts to try to uh, develop its own level of stability, whether it will then fall under the scrutiny of the international community as being uh, seen as either a pariah state or one that is uncooperative into providing stability within uh, Afghanistan itself. Shindeshu, uh, China has said that it's willing to work with the Taliban in Afghanistan. Um, there is even talk of expanding the Belt and Road Initiative, its sort of signature outreach to the developing world, into Afghanistan as well. Um, how far is China willing to go? Well, I think right now China is being cautious. Uh, you know, people have different discussions inside this country and how far we can go. Uh, in particular with those uh, important projects uh, with huge investment, economic investment over there. I think that security is the number one concern. Uh, obviously, you want to see a stable government, an inclusive government, hopefully, uh, because an inclusive government, uh, people will see that as uh, you know laying a foundation for a stable country, a stable government. Uh, and then, of course, China would like to see some actions from the Taliban government uh, against some of the extremist groups in the inside of the country, uh, because that's also uh, a concern for China, for example, Xinjiang, which is neighboring uh, the Xinjiang province, neighboring uh, Afghanistan directly. Uh, so people would be concerned about ETIM, whether you know all those fighters have been uh, either driven out of this country or somehow being, let's say, uh, attitudes have been changed. They are not welcome anymore in Afghanistan. Uh, or they need to cooperate with the Chinese side to make sure there are no extremist uh, you know, fighters against the Chinese interests, at least from the Chinese point of view. Of course, there are other extremist groups like ISK. You know, I don't think they are welcomed by any neighboring countries. So in that sense, yes, uh, I would say it, take, it still takes some time for the Chinese side to uh, somehow feel you know, sure, certain about the, about the situation, and then they are ready to go ahead with the investment and economic cooperation in the country. Zara Shams, you know, from what we're hearing, it seems that the primary goal right now is to make sure that Afghanistan is stable. Uh, these countries want to see a stable neighbor there. But it seems like inside Afghanistan itself, the Taliban appears to be split on how they want to move forward. Um, we were talking to a senior Taliban leader. He said something to us. And then we talked to the country's acting foreign minister. I want to play you two of those excerpts, um, which could give us an indication of how divided they are. Let's listen. Yeah, we will not yes, we will not accept any aid, foreign or overseas aid, if they put conditions. We want good relations with the international community. We want mutual relations. Our demand from the international community is not to put any further pressure on the Afghans. So, Zala Shams, is, is the Taliban, in terms of policy, divided? Uh, yeah, there are rumors, and uh, when uh, we see, uh, it seems that uh, they might be right, uh, because uh, uh, the Taliban uh, political leadership and Taliban military uh, commanders, uh, one is like, uh, um, there are rumors that the Haqqani network, uh, which were more powerful and ruthless uh, in, in the, uh, their uh, war against the international forces and the Afghan uh, previous government, uh, compared to the Kandahar Taliban, uh, which were the successors of uh, uh, Mullah Omar. Uh, but still, they, uh, during their insurgency, it was difficult, and they were quite united. Now they are in the government, and um, we believe that there will be more uh, difference of opinion, and it will be bigger than a difference of opinion uh, to, to maybe uh, split and divisions. Uh, but so far, they, because of their ideological background, uh, they, they, they are stick to, to one agenda. Uh, but still, uh, there, are, uh, there are conflict going on. 
uh, on policy level level and uh, when we see that uh, uh, they are more strict in their uh, sharia or the strict islamic version of implementation of the uh, government uh, and then st still there are moderate uh, taliban uh, that they believe that uh, to rule afghanistan they should be uh, governing in a moderate way so uh, there is some possibility that uh, there will be split among them but still uh, they would try to uh, still uh, remain intact because we saw that Mullah Biradar, who, who were leading uh, from Kandahar, uh, uh, and uh, there were rumors that he is not okay with uh, what's going on, and the government that were announced, the, they were expecting an inclusive form of government, and Mullah Biradar was uh, in, in support of that government. But we saw that uh, Haqqanis took more share right. since they entered Kabul. So there might be possibility that it will affect the, the uh, future policy of Taliban. Said Khan, what are your thoughts? Uh, you were talking a moment ago about these divisions, but what are your thoughts uh, on how this could impact the Taliban uh, governing in Afghanistan? I mean, could these divisions deepen to the point where it becomes a serious problem? There's always that possibility. I mean, as far as looking at the uh, recent history of Afghanistan, uh, certainly the words inclusion and consensus don't immediately come to, uh, to mind and to bear. But it seems as though these are growing pains for a nascent uh, administration in Kabul. Uh, and given the fact that uh, neither the Taliban nor the Haqqani network want to see themselves uh, be subject to further de uh, destabilization, which would give an opportunity for either uh, the Panjshir province, uh, the anti-Taliban forces, or worse, uh, external Western forces to then have a justification to re-enter and re-engage Afghanistan, it seems more likely that they will be able to then reach a resolution about this. Right now, it seems as though part of it is based on bragging rights. Uh, were the Taliban uh, responsible for uh, taking the country back uh, ostensibly from the United States, or were the Haqqani network uh, more uh, responsible for it, diplomacy versus uh, military prowess? Again, these are rhetorical issues that can have an impact on uh, the administration and the viability of a Taliban uh, government, but it seems as though uh, those things should dissipate uh, sooner rather than later. Eugene, the SCO was created to ensure security, maintain regional stability in the region. Um, and as you pointed out a moment ago, it also is an organization that facilitates dialogue among the member states. But it really is Russia, isn't it, uh, that is the guarantor of regional security. You wrote a piece in Foreign Policy recently in which you say that actually there is a division of labor when it comes to Russia and China and Central Asia. Tell us more about uh, how this division of labor works and how it fits into what we're currently seeing in Afghanistan. Right. So if you look at Central Asia, a lot is made out of this potential Russian and Chinese rivalry because there's overlapping spheres of influence. But actually, the strategies of Russia and China are quite aligned in the sense that they both prioritize uh, maintaining stability in the region, and they have different ways of doing so. So China is the one that you know invests large amounts of money into major infrastructure projects. Uh, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, it provides a lot of investment. Russia is the traditional security guarantor and provider. So those two things don't necessarily clash. Of course, there are minor issues that arise between the two, but overall, they're able to collaborate. And I think that same paradigm can be applied to Afghanistan um, in the sense that both Russia and China do want to preserve stability first and foremost. They want to prevent militancy within Afghanistan, but especially spilling over. Of course, the situation in Afghanistan is different from Central Asia. I mean, Russia and China are not nearly as influential there. There's a lot more um, external actors that are quite uh, influential, like Pakistan, Iran, India. It's a more crowded playing field. But I think for now, Russia and China are quite aligned in their interests in Afghanistan. And uh, this will be very important moving forward. Shindoshu, is that something that would work for China? Um where it could expand its economic interests, its trade interests in the region, uh, while it, to some extent, relies on Russia to maintain security? Uh, I think there's uh, no issue from the Chinese point of view. Um, China recognized uh, you know, the traditional influence of Russia, uh, you know, former Soviet Union, in particular in the Central Asian uh, countries. Uh, so that's a reality. And China does not have desire to play a you know, uh, security role in this region. 
or at least not as much as the Russians rule over there. Uh, so yes, I totally agree with the previous speaker. China stressed very much about uh, uh, economic role in stabilizing the region, in creating opportunities, uh, in creating prosperity in this region. That's Chinese belief through trade and investment. And then uh, you will see young people would uh, uh, learn to enjoy life instead of being uh, advocated or being drawn into some extremist ideology. Uh, so that's why you see Belt and Road uh, programs, and also you see the SDU Bank. Um, you know, previously China also, uh, you know, a a actually, you know, advocated more uh, for SDU to play a more important role in terms of trade and investment, but uh, that, that was not uh, completely accepted by SDU members, in particular by Russia. But that's fine. Uh, for China, it is doing what it can, and uh, uh, of course, with the support of SU member uh, countries over there. Said Khan, uh, I think it was you who told us earlier on that the SCO operates um, its charter on the basis of unanimity. Well, let's look at one member, Tajikistan, which you mentioned. It has expressed deep concerns uh, that Afghanistan could again become a haven for terrorists. Uh, this is the president of uh, Tajikistan speaking. Let's listen. Using political and military vacuum, various terrorist groups strengthen their positions in the country. Afghanistan is turning our eyes into a hotbed of international terrorism. According to information we receive from various regions of Afghanistan, the real situation on the place is completely different. It's many times worse than the one presented by media. So, Sai, to what extent are these valid concerns? Because the Taliban, or certain Taliban leaders, have gone to quite some, some measure to tell us that, look, this is not going to happen in the future. Again, looking at the past history of Afghanistan, uh, that would be cause for anyone uh, to be concerned about the prospect of a reemergence of Afghanistan being a platform for transnational extremist organizations. And the two big ones, of course, that are still looming are al-Qaeda and, at least in the case of Afghanistan, the, uh, the Khorasan uh, franchise of, uh, of ISIS uh, operating there. Uh, neither right now is uh, a very uh, good prospect for the Taliban uh, to support, uh, nor would it be uh, very prudent for the Taliban to allow uh, ISIS-K or uh, al-Qaeda to operate within uh, Afghanistan in any measure, first and foremost because ISIS-K has its own issues uh, with, uh, with the Taliban, so there would be then a threat to uh, the Taliban regime directly. But the, again, the prospect of Western intervention re, uh, recurring in Afghanistan is something that the Taliban simply don't want. Uh, for them, uh, they realize that this is a moment where Afghanistan is finally back to the agency of Afghans. Without Western involvement, uh, a revisitation of that is something that is not really palatable. The second uh, thing, in taking issue with the, uh, the Tajik leader, uh, this is not a political vacuum in Afghanistan. The Taliban have proven their mettle by uh, sweeping into power, not only in Kabul, but in the provincial capitals. As a result of that, and the stability that potentially that they can bring, uh, one of their goals is going to have to be to remove uh, extremism. And part of it is, of course, an economic incentive. Remember, back in the 1990s, there were only three countries that recognized the Taliban and gave it any legitimacy. Here, as we were talking about SCO, the potential for that doubling, tripling, and quadrupling uh, is, uh, is quite high. That kind of legitimacy brings stability and brings incentive to root out extremism. Zara Shams, what do you think? Do you share that view that the Taliban is now in power and they want to consolidate that power? Uh, they don't want to invite uh, another intervention by the United States or by some other country um, so that they are not going to be playing host to terrorist groups in the country. And that, of course, begs another question. Are they in total control or could they also fall victim to certain groups getting into the country against their wishes? Yeah, the Taliban would highly uh, want uh, that such uh, thing uh, doesn't happen and it become uh, uh, home to, to the invasion of any country, including the Western or other, or it can make trouble to the regional countries, including China and Russia. Uh, but the reality is something different. Looking at the, the history and background of Afghanistan, uh, and we see the neighbors, particularly Pakistan, which is also uh, quite fertile uh, for such radicalism, even um, their state uh, was sponsoring, and uh, it's not difficult, and uh, we, can, we can't 
unimagined or we can imagine that uh, they can still uh, use a, a, as a tool of their foreign policy. So looking at such environment, it's uh, highly possible uh, that uh, such thing can again happen. Afghanistan style can be by international terror, by radical elements, and Taliban, uh, if they don't form an inclusive government, which the all Afghans are not represented from every aspect of life, uh, then uh, their their state, their, their government will be vulnerable. And in such vulnerable situation, then any element can take advantage of it. So one Taliban statements, they would not like uh, to uh, that such situation uh, should happen. But in uh, the other scenarios, if there is a weak government, if there is no Afghan representation, if Afghan doesn't see uh, 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 themselves in, in the central government, so then there's a high possibility that such elements uh, can resurface and can utilize. Because one thing is that uh, uh, we see in the neighborhood in Pakistan, even Daesh or ISIS came from Pakistan. It was mostly the, 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 the local uh, um, uh, breed of uh, ISIS. And including the Al-Qaeda, there are sleeper cells, and uh, they, they might be in a dormant form. But th th this is a, a real threat again. Right. Uh, Eugene, of course, the SCO is a disparate organization, as we heard uh, a moment ago. I mean, you have Pakistan on one side, you have India on the other. We just heard the views of Tajikistan, which is very different from some of the other countries. So given all those differences, um, what is the best uh, outcome for this summit that will take place? I think first and foremost, it's a, you know, an opportunity for all of these countries to uh, come together and have a dialogue and see where they can overlap. I think the broader goal of maintaining stability uh, and preventing any kind of security threats from spilling over is one that's shared by all of the countries that will be present um, at the SBO summit. Of course, every country has their own individual interests. Perhaps they, perhaps they can strike some level of um, security coordination. Russia has already held military exercises with several Central Asian countries, also with China as well. Perhaps more of that can be forthcoming. I don't see any major breakthroughs, but essentially it's going to be a platform for coordinating future uh, security dialogues as it pertains to Afghanistan. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.